Um, I'm going to introduce this first. I am ready. Okay. Thank you. Yes, mine is, and and there it is, telling me that. Uh, thank you very much. Make it. I should be looking at. Yes, at me. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tim Naftali. I'm director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. It's March 27, 2009. We're in Washington, D.C., and I have the honor and privilege to be interviewing Harold Saunders for the Nixon Oral History Program. Mr. Saunders, thank you for doing this. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, just to set uh, context of your career, uh, how, did you, how and when did you enter government? I entered government in the summer of 1956 after I got a Ph.D. in American Civilization at Yale. And uh, almost immediately, I went, came in through the CIA junior officer trainee program. They had a deal with the Air Force whereby, since I needed to do my military service, I was 25 and a half years old, uh, I could go, I could enlist in the Air Force, go to basic training, officer candidate school, and then do a year of Air Force service and then be detailed back to CIA for uh, my training as a junior officer. So I did all that, came back to CIA after my year of Air Force training in the summer of 58. I came out of that training and got it. My first job was as a staff assistant to the man who ran the analytical side of the agency, the Deputy Director for Intelligence, Bob Amory, and uh, uh, was a staff assistant to him for a year. Uh, we serviced the officer of Alan Dulles, who was the Director of Central Intelligence. Then I went to work in the Office of Current Intelligence for a couple of years, but when I was in the Deputy Director's office, one of the men working there was a man named Bob Comer, who was the agency's representative on the Eisenhower National Security Council Staff's Planning Board. And he also, uh, being part of CIA, knew William Bundy. And when the Kennedy administration came in, William Bundy's brother, McGeorge Bundy, became Kennedy's National Security Advisor and invited Bob Comer to go and work on the National Security Council Staff. And in September, Bob <laughs> invited me to come and work with him as his assistant. So my entry into the intelligence community through the Air Force and so on was a sort of indoctrination to government broadly, but my introduction into the policy world really happened in, in September 1961 when I worked to, uh, went to work on the Kennedy National Security Council staff, and I stayed there until 1974. Did you work on Middle Eastern issues at the agency? No, I did not. I worked, of all things, on East Asian issues, particularly Japan, about which I had known nothing. I guess what I was hired for was a, a PhD and the research capabilities that went with that. Did you send her a study under Ralph Gabriel? He was my dissertation advisor, uh, along with David Potter. What was your dissertation on? It uh, was titled The Group Concept of Social and Political Organization in American Thought from 1880 to 1930. And then you worked on Japan. Yeah. Uh, you come into the uh, Kennedy uh, NSC. Um, what tasks are you given? Do you work on the Middle East at that point? Bob Comer was working on a very broad agenda. The, the staff was only, if I recall, maybe nine, nine people at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he had the Middle East, South Asia, military assistance worldwide and Africa on some occasions. But I was working mainly on the Near East South Asia part of that portfolio. So yes, I, uh, that's where I learned something about the Middle East. I can, the kind of learning experience one has as a young person in that situation was I can remember his coming back from the West Wing one day and say, saying, uh, draft a letter for the president to send to President Nasser of Egypt on whatever the subject was. And I'd never written a letter for a president or to a president before, so it required a little bit of thinking. And I finally decided, well, I'm going to try my best to put myself into President Kennedy's mind and speak like him and write like him, and knowing what he knows and what Nasser knows about this subject. Uh, that was my 
that's the first uh, task I remember that really made an impression on me. Um, scholars would be interested in knowing that the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government's impression of Nasser and its efforts to perhaps bring him over to our side at various times. Um, can you, it's a long time ago, but can you can you uh, lay out for us a little bit about the sort of the evolution of our policy that you saw starting in the Kennedy period? Yes, and I think uh, Bob Comer, for whom I was working, played a significant role in this. I think uh, Kennedy came in, as you'll recall, when after the whole Aswan Dam affair with Egypt and uh, the sense that the Egypt was moving into the Soviet orbit. And of course, Nasser was one of the major figures in the non-aligned movement, which again was not always that uh, positive about the United States. So, But on the other hand, he was a major leader in the Middle East, and Egypt was a, the major country in, in Middle Eastern politics. So the thought that I know Bob Conner brought in, and, and Kennedy was quite receptive to that, was the, the notion that let's see if we can't wean him away, or at least partially away, from the Soviet orbit, and could we begin to create a at least a working relationship with him. So that, that was the genesis, and there were a lot of small things that went on, and a lot of very big things, too. The whole business of food assistance, our surplus wheat, PL480 uh, food assistance to, to Egypt, and uh, even right on down to, I can remember Jacqueline Kennedy doing writing a handwritten note to, to Nasser on her personal stationery about the uh, Abu Simbel temples that were about to be inundated by the Aswan Dam and became, of course, a, uh, the object of a UN, a UNESCO effort to save them and lift them up, restore them, or replace them on higher ground. So there were a lot of little things, big and little things, that uh, were done to try to bring Nasser uh, in our direction. Not not with any feeling that you could cause him to do a complete flip and walk away from Soviet backers or uh, give up his position as a non-aligned leader, but maybe modulate the rhetoric a bit, maybe uh, <coughs> potentially in the Arab-Israeli context get somebody who might be more amenable to reason or negotiation. Even in this early period, 60, 61, I mean 61, 62, um, there is a, a real tension between the Iraqis and the Egyptians, uh, which would remain an interesting uh, t tension for us, for, um, which we could use. I mean, it, we, we would use it to develop better relations with Egypt, not with Iraq. Well, the Iraqis, I think, always regarded themselves and do to this day and 2009 as the center of civilization, the origins of civilization, and the idea that uh, Egypt should pretend to leadership in the Arab world was obviously offensive to them, and so hence the rivalry was very deep-seated. Um, uh, com compare and contrast, please, uh, the Kennedy NSC to the Johnson NSC. Very interesting comparison. <clears throat> One of those memories that I never have never forgotten and to this day often quote is a statement that was made to me by a senior colleague. I believe, if I remember correctly, it was somebody who was in the one of the top two or three in the Office of Management and Budget to which the NSC staff related closely. But this gentleman said to me one time, remember, policy is never made on paper. It's a continuously changing mix of people and ideas. It's a direction, not a decision. Mm -hmm. You stop to think about the import of that for the way political scientists, for instance, have studied this presidential policy making. It's, it's the import of it is, is profound, but that being the uh, the case, I think we were part of the continuously changing mix of people and ideas, but the principle 
person, of course, was the president himself in, in that. Uh, now, given that approach or way of thinking about policy making, the Kennedy NSC operation was a very loose one. As I said, the senior people on the NSC staff were maybe eight or nine people, and uh, they were interacting often directly with the president, certainly very closely through Mac Bundy, but it was all very loose and inchoate, but vibrant. A lot of things got done, and of course, even the president was described in the press as calling up desk officers in the State Department to get their views and so on. So that was the, the atmosphere in the Kennedy period. Now, when Johnson came to office, uh, he was suspicious of this loose arrangement and began to introduce some discipline into it. And he moved in the direction of moving the the principal review of policy recommendations over from the NSC uh, staff to the State Department. Just to parenthetically to, to note that the NSC system operates on three levels. The first is the assistant secretary level and the uh, relevant departments, given a particular policy issue. Their job is to lay out all reasonable options. And I think actually that's a quote from Nixon, not from the Kennedy-Johnson period. But the idea was to lay out all reasonable options. Then those were passed up to the middle level of the NSC system, a review committee of some kind. It went by different names in different administrations. And in the Kennedy period, that review was done by the NSC staff. And what Johnson did was to move that review process over to the State Department under the direction of the, uh, what we would today call the Deputy Secretary, the, the number two in the State Department, and the, his counterpart in the Defense Department. I, th I sort of pictured Johnson saying to <coughs> Secretary Rusk and Secretary McNamara, you guys are s smart fellows, and, but you've got a lot of people working for you who are nat naturally committed to certain approaches to international affairs. So I want you to get their options, and I want the two of you to put yourself in my shoes and come to me with a recommendation that you have worked out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's indeed the way the system went. The recommendation came from that review committee situated in the State Department to the National Security Council itself, where the president, of course, would would be present and would have open discussion and so on. So Johnson injected more order in it. He was more confident in that. And he wanted to force his lieutenants, so to speak, to uh, help him out to figure out how to bridge some of the gaps that the bureau bureaucratically produced options would uh, hinge on. If I could just take it a step farther then into the, into the Nixon period, Nixon following Johnson came in and said, look, if I just get one recommendation from the bureaucracy, I'm not going to have any choice because all the energy of the bureaucracy will have gone into producing that one recommendation. I want choices. So the review process was moved back to the White House in the uh, committee chaired by the National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, and then the options would go to, to, to Nixon in, in the uh, NSC meeting itself. And there are a couple of marvelous examples of that, which I'll leave till later, not to disrupt your uh, well, no, what line of thought. While they're in your mind, please tell us now. One of the most dramatic and I think best organized National Security Council meetings took place uh, on a Friday, a week before the 1967 Arab-Israeli war broke out. Abba Iban, the foreign minister of Israel, had been sent by his government to Washington to find out what the United States planned to do about Nasser's closure of the Strait of Tehran. 
And an NSC meeting took place in the morning of that Friday. Iban was arriving and would see President Johnson that evening. Uh, so uh, Johnson had invited into the uh, into the ca cabinet room for the NSC meeting several uh, people from outside the government, uh, Dean, uh, Dean Atchison, Clark Clifford, and maybe Abe Fortas. I'm not sure about that, but uh, and I am still back in the Johnson administration. I haven't moved Nixon, but uh, the he heard it was set up. The meeting was set up so that the Assistant Secretary for the Middle East presented the Arab point of view, and Assistant Secretary for International Organizations Affairs uh, presented the. Israeli point of view, and then, of course, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff gave a military analysis and so on. After hearing all the the pros and cons, and, and Dean Rusk had just come from the Capitol Hill where he'd talked to the Congress, came in with his assessment of what the Congress was willing to do. We were, out, were of course, in the middle of the Vietnam War, and the idea of another war in the Middle East, of which we are a part, was not attractive to the Congress or anybody else. But in any case, when the end of the meeting Johnson went around the table and said, he started out by saying at the end of the day, this evening, I'm going, I'm the one who's going to have to bell this cat, that, that was his Texas phrase, talking about Abba even, I'm going to have to tell him what the United States is going to do. And I want each one of you to tell me what you would say to Iban. And I realized at that point that Johnson wasn't collecting pros and cons for decisions, he was collecting the judgments of minds whose uh, pe people whose minds he understood and trusted and valued. So it was that kind of decision making. Then if you f forward into the Nixon NSC, it was much more a sense that uh, Nixon preferred not to make decisions in that kind of interaction among people. He, he wanted to hear arguments and then he would go off himself with his yellow pad and do his list of pros and cons and do his thinking uh, on his own. Johnson, of course, not only preferred to make decisions by talking with people, after this rather systematic working out of options, and, and that, of course, was captured in, with Johnson in the, uh, the Tuesday lunch uh, meetings during the Vietnam War, which became more informal. But that's just all a preface to say that, uh, as I've often told people who ask me about the NSC system, uh, that there's no right way or wrong way to organize presiden presidential decision making. It's the boss's way. It's the way the president chooses to use people to learn from them. And it's the way he, ch by nature, t tends to make up his own mind. And, uh, so you get three, four presidents there who are uh, who are perfect examples of, of the systems working in. There's another important personality, though not as important as the president, and that's the personality of the assistant to the president mm -hmm. for national security affairs. Um, Mick George Bundy, Rostow, Kissinger, Brzezinski, Scowcroft, perhaps. Did you? So you've worked under five. Well, I, I worked with Brandt. Uh, he yes. was. When Henry Kissinger became Secretary of State in yes. September, I guess, of 73, 73. Uh, Brent, Re Henry was still the National Security Advisor in names of Brent, but Brent was the, the head of our staff, and I worked with him uh, until July of 74 when I moved over to the State Department. But compare and contrast, please, <laughs> these five <laughs> different gentlemen. Mac Bundy was, uh, had a piercing intellect and was the one who, and of course he was working with a president who had a piercing <coughs> intellect, so his emphasis was on clear, uh, rigid analysis, not in any formalistic sense of the word, but in the two-page memo, you needed to be totally rational and lay it out 
uh, raise the questions, answer them, and, and so on. <coughs> Rostow was more the conceptualizer, uh, <coughs> not so much that intellectual rigor, but more the, the person who looked at the big picture, tried to see things in that context, and uh, to lay out arguments that way. I would say that uh, whereas Bundy was working for a president who did want to be the principal policy maker, uh, Rostow regarded himself as a person to get the best out of, work with the secretaries, the cabinet officers who were involved in foreign affairs on behalf of the president. So. Uh, he used to say, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a messenger. Well, that wasn't entirely true because he introduced a lot of his <coughs> thinking and conceptual thought, but he, there was no antagonism between him and uh, Rusk and, and, uh, and McNamara, or was there, I think, between those two gentlemen. <coughs> Kissinger came in, and you can almost describe the evolution of the NSC staff, I don't want to say year by year, but in certain stages. When Henry came in, <coughs> he insisted on rigorous analysis, more in the, the Bundy style, but uh, not in the, the terse one-pager, but in the well-worked-out <coughs> policy paper style. And uh, he was absolutely scrupulous. And, pushing you as hard as he could to make sure that the argument that maybe you didn't believe in was as well stated as the argument that you might have believed in. Uh, I think that if you went back to the NSC files that first year that President Nixon was in office, you probably would find some of the best staff work in the files of any government anywhere in the world at any time. It was really very, very good analytical work. Now, as time evolved, Henry got his feet on the ground, and issues came up where he had more of a sense of a policy or a strategy that he recommended. He began to get involved more in the bureaucratic I'm going to use the word manipulation. I think that's probably a little bit too devious in its sound at the initial stage. But he began to use the system uh, a little bit more to deal with the president's questions. Uh, then as, as time went on, certain things became his policy babies. I mean, there was the back channel with Dobrinin. De there was the, <coughs> the there were the the feelers through various back channel back channels on the uh, that led to the opening with China, and uh, <coughs> ultimately we uh, had a similar effort with uh, with the Egyptians, and so on. So, but. For instance, in Middle East policy, which, I, which is where I was involved, Henry came to the NSC staff and say, I, I knew very little about Middle East policy. And, and uh, of course, the State Department was right there with, with new initiatives and, and, and so on. And he was suspicious of those, but really did not choose to insert himself other than through occasional memos to the president <coughs> on strategy, but he was really playing it quite straight, and, and uh, Secretary Rogers was given by the president the lead in Middle East policy, and Kissinger did not initially uh, meddle with that, but as time went on, then he got more and more into it, and, and so on. Uh, <coughs> Brzezinski, I would say, was uh, he did a, a, an effective job of, of running the NSC staff and, and uh, producing options for the for the president and so on. But 
he also was more of the the uh, producer of of uh, flashy ideas. He, he a mile a minute come up with <coughs> sparkle with new insights, different insights, and so on. But uh, <coughs> in the Middle East, Middle East policy, where I obviously worked very closely with Secretary Vance and and with President Carter. Uh, I think Carter, in that instance anyway, tended to rely on the very steady and sound judgment of Secretary Vance rather than the uh, more sparkly ideas of, of Brzezinski. Um, I want to pick up on something you said about uh, the, sort of the, the evolution of Kissinger's willingness to engage in bureaucratic politics. In the case of his uh, uh, contentious relationship with Secretary Rogers in the, on the on Middle East policy, would you say the turning point was Secretary Rogers' December 1969 uh, speech that uh, the Rogers plan, the Rogers plan that that made Israel so angry? That was certainly a significant event, and and even Henry would say that. That, that had been approved by the president, which was the case, and Henry, of course, had been <clears throat> had been part of that. I think reluctantly so, but uh, so he. I don't think he would have. He did not accuse Rogers of going off and doing this on his own. It was approved by the president. And so the problem, though, was in Henry's notion. Okay, uh, how do we how do we now work our way beyond this to something that. That we can do, and of course, remember there was there, there, there came to be very soon something else that was involved here, and that was that the the Soviets became even more obviously in, involved as the war of attrition on the Suez Canal unfolded, and that, of course, is a saga of its own. But it was when the Soviets, as, as the Soviets moved into the the picture. Uh, and they had been part of it even before the, while the Rogers plan was still in gestation. But uh, I think it was a combination of circumstances that led to uh, Henry's gradually taking charge and ultimately taking charge of the dialogue with the Soviets over the Middle East and, and, and so on. Can you recall, do you recall the missions that Len Garment was sent on? Very vaguely, but uh, I couldn't well, resurrect him. Precisely. My impression from interviewing him was that he was sent to tell, uh, he, he was sent to Israel to tell them to not, not to worry about Sen Secretary Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I wondered if you, if you recall how those, those missions came about. Um, Given that you've, you've had this sweep of you had this sweep of experience in various NSCs, I'd like to look at a few issue areas that will become important in the Nixon period, but which have antecedents: um, Israel and the bomb. Um, uh, this is an issue for President Kennedy. Um, did you work on that problem at all? Well, it was during that period that the uh, <coughs> inspections of the nuclear facility at Damana were uh, instigated, and. Uh, so yes, we were in, involved in promoting those those inspections, which of course uh, went on for a while and then gradually became fewer and fewer and and drifted off. In the, in the summer of '69, <coughs> this becomes a big issue again, um, <coughs> and uh, there was a question of whether to uh, sell. Uh, Phantom F, uh, F6, F4s, F4s, I guess. F4s. Um, uh, and whether to do that, if, uh, despite the fact Israel hadn't signed the NPT. Do, do you recall that debate uh, at all in the summer? Oh yeah, there was a the, the centerpiece of the, of the whole exercise was a series of conversations between then Ambassador Yitzhak Rabin, and I think Townsend Hoops in the Defense Department, anyway, somebody, sort of the uh, 
senior assistant secretary or undersecretary level in defense, <laughs> trying to get the Israelis to sign some agreement that would permit us to say that the aircraft would not be used to carry a nuclear weapon. And uh, the phrase that we wanted the Israelis to agree to was that they would not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. <laughs> I can remember very well, uh, I don't remember all the details of the discussions they went on for several months, but uh, I remember coming down to what was referred to in the bureaucracy as the last wire argument. Rabin said, what does it mean to introduce a nuclear weapon <laughs> into the Middle East? What if you have all the components of it and you just haven't hooked up the last wire? Does that mean you've introduced weapons or, or not? They were obviously 